Welcome to the Radical History of 2020. Normally, uh, in this date in July, we meet in the, the village school or in a tent or a marquee. But here, because of the coronavirus, uh, we've decided to, uh, to bring the Radical History School online. And uh, it's my great pleasure this afternoon to welcome Dr. Rose Wallace uh, to the Radical History School 2020. Very different to last year. <laughs> Uh, I know Rose was uh, thinking last year about how she was going to manage in a tent, but you did brilliantly well, I have to say that. And that's why you got invited back this year, I think. Uh, Rose is a senior lecturer in, in British social history at the University of the West of England. Uh, her, re her research and teachings focus on criminal justice, histories and heritage. She's got a particular interest in county government and the magistracy of the 18th and 19th centuries, uh, particularly in the prosecution of social protests. She's also a consultant historian for the Shire Hall Historic Museum in Dorset, which many of us will have been to, and Associate Director of the Regional History Centre in the UWE. Thank you very much to all of you who have joined us. I think there's something like uh, 51 now joined us. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, there is a code of conduct which I've sent out to all panellists, uh, and you'll be able to read that, so uh, hopefully that's okay. If you've got questions and answers, uh, could you please put those into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen? And we'll be keeping an eye on that. If you'd like to chat to each other, um, then pl please feel free to chat in the chat box. I won't be keeping an eye on that with regard to questions. Uh, and we've already got some uh, some comments coming in. It's very nice to see you all there. Thank you so much uh, for the very kind comments that people have already put up. And now I'm going to hand that. Oh, I'm going to ask Rose first. What got you interested in history in the first place, Rose? Um, well, I think I've been interested in history for as long as I can remember, and I think it probably came in part from my, my lovely dad, who's no longer with us, um, but he was very interested in history and he'd kind of raise historical perspectives or muse on what it was like to live in the past um, pretty much at every given opportunity. So I think that kind of influenced me. I've always liked um, historic novels, well not necessarily novels, but historic stories and imagining what it was like to to live in the past. Um, and then I've had some amazingly influential teachers. My secondary school teacher, Lawrence Wilmshurst, who was a big unionist. Um, he was a big influence on me. A big shout out. <laughs> yeah, a big shout out to him. Um, yeah, but also my, uh, my colleague, Steve Poole at um, UWE, who will be speaking later for the festival. Um, he's really the one who kind of encouraged and developed my interest in criminal justice histories. So there's, yeah, shout out to him as well. <laughs> Excellent. Well, we, uh, I'm looking forward to Steve's session as much as I'm looking forward to this one as well. So that's great. Thank you very much, Rose. So, Rose, I, I now intend to hand over to you for a little while while we investigate uh, the topic that you're going to bring to us this afternoon. I look forward to it. Thank you. So now I've got to do the little technical bit, which involves sharing my screen. And hopefully um, people can see that. So <clears throat> the topic of my talk today is about exploring criminal lives. Um, and the online resources that we can use to do that. Now, one of the reasons why we should study crime, I think, or why I study crime and its regulation, is the extraordinary insight it gives us into past societies. What was considered criminal and how it was treated reflects the values and attitudes of the time. And obviously this changes over time as well. The other important thing about the records of criminal justice is that it offers an insight into the lived experience of ordinary people who are otherwise frequently absent from the historical record. Working people don't often leave accounts of their lives, certainly not in the 18th and 19th centuries. We don't have access to diaries, memoirs, even correspondence necessarily. When their lives are recorded, it's often where they impinge on government. So in terms of being recorded in the census, perhaps, or in the records of the poor law, but also in the courts. Now, the records of criminal justice don't just allow us to see how people were treated at law or oppressed by the courts even, but their records reveal other details, perhaps incidental to the prosecution of crime, but that help us understand what their lives were like. So hopefully this is going to work. Um, she says, trying to change the slide. There we go. Um, one of the first online resources I used way back um, as an undergraduate was this, the Old Bailey Proceedings Online, which offer really detailed transcripts of some of the trials that took place at the Old Bailey in London between 1674 and 1913. I think there's now almost 200,000 cases online. Now, as well as the scope for all sorts of studies of patterns of crime, prosecution and punishment, 
the proceedings reveal details of ordinary lived experience. By reading against the grain, so beyond or apart from the focus of the criminal trials, the testimonies of the thousands of witnesses, prosecutors and defendants discuss all aspects of life. In an edition of the London Journal published to mark the completion um, of the digital archive in 2005, it showcased its potential with articles concerning all sorts of things, but including the family lives of soldiers and sailors gleaned from the proceedings and on homosexual culture, not just its persecution, but the social and mental world of gay men in Georgian London. In their introduction to this edition, Tim Hitchcock and Bob Shoemaker celebrated the potential for online archives to make material once disregarded and inaccessible available. An everyday resource, they called it, consulted not just by scholars, but by family and local historians, journalists, and the simply curious. Now, I think it's really owing to the interest of local and family historians that we've seen the proliferation of online archives. These are just some of the ones that um, I'm gonna be referencing today. Um, on the slide. And these aren't just focused on London, we've got material from regional and national and international repositories now. From my point of view as a researcher, but also as a teacher, thinking about my students, online archives have become even more important with the closure of public spaces during the COVID pandemic. Now, these archives aren't without their limits, but they can offer an extraordinary window on the past. And I'm pretty sure from some of the comments I've seen, some people may already be familiar with these. So what I'm gonna try and do today is talk through a sort of practical example of how we researched one of the cases for Shire Hall Courthouse Museum in Dorchester. Uh, Les has already mentioned that some of you may have been there, but if you haven't, the museum was opened in 2018 and it's there to <clears throat> discuss the history of English criminal justice, but also to help us think about what justice is and what the role of law is in society in the past and present. So the case I'm going to be talking about concerns the prosecution of Elijah Upjohn for the theft of a pair of trousers. He was tried in April 1834. Now, this was just a couple of weeks after the toll puddle martyrs had stood in that very same dock in the courtroom. Now, aside from the local link um, to the festival, I chose this case because it's one that we built up from quite a broad range of often online archival material. So hopefully it will provide an example of what we can expect to find in terms of the archives of regional courts and some of the things that we can do with that online material. Now, unfortunately, we don't have the sort of detailed evidence available to us in the Old Bailey proceedings in regional records. Often the testimonies of those involved in a trial don't survive. So we have to piece together a story from often brief details, but by considering them in context and in relation to other records, we can create a much fuller picture of past lives. So this is um, a piece of artwork um, that was commissioned for Shire Hall that depicts Elijah. Now he was charged with the theft of a pair of trousers, as I've mentioned, that had been drying on some railings by the churchyard in Shaftesbury, also in Dorset. He'd taken them to a pawnbroker and tried to pledge them for a shilling, but the pawnbroker was suspicious, partly because the trousers did not look like they'd fit um, Elijah, and he was quickly found out. Now, there's very little detail of how Upjohn conducted himself during the trial. There's no evidence of what he said in his defence, and there's no comment on it in the press. What was reported on was his age. He was only 11. Hopefully you can see that in the slightly fuzzy uh, clipping there. And this is what piqued our interest really in this case. What could his story tell us about the experience of young people in the criminal justice system? So we needed to find out more about Elijah. And our first port of call were these, um, the prison registers, which are held at Dorset History Centre in Dorchester, but they've also been digitised and made available via Ancestry, the genealogical website. And these registers can be a mine of information when we start to interpret the details and put them in context. So hopefully I'm going to be able to use my cursor here. So we should be able to see Elijah Upjohn um, and his offence, stealing trousers. But there are also some other details that are important apart from the charge. We've got his occupation listed as a labourer 
Now, it's not that unusual to find a boy of 11 with a purported occupation at this point, but labour is kind of a catch-all generic term. What it signals to us is that he has no specific or skilled trade, which means he may well have been in and out of work, um, especially considering his age, but also the problems of under and unemployment um, in the 1830s. So this might give us sort of some idea about motive, perhaps. Um, next, we have his physical description here. Um, he's described as being four foot ten, a fair complexion, hazel eyes and light brown hair. Now, this might not seem like a particularly significant historical detail, but I think it's quite powerful when we start to think about or imagine this 11 year old boy facing the awesome prospect of the courtroom at Shire Hall, which is a space calculated to communicate the majesty of the law. So we get a, a feeling of what it might have been like for him. We also have the sentence just here, um, imprisonment, three calendar months, and to be twice whipped. Now, believe it or not, the magistrates have exercised their discretion here and tailored the charge very much according to his age. They've been relatively lenient, I suppose. Now, there's no distinction made in the statutes for larceny or the punishments for it that were based around one's age. There was a recognised age of criminal responsibility. It was seven, and so below that age, you couldn't be considered responsible for your actions. Now, Elijah, unfortunately, was 11, which meant certainly if they could prove that he'd tried to deceive someone, which he had, the pawnbroker, then he was absolutely criminally culpable. The maximum sentence for charge of larceny at this point was transportation to Australia for seven years or up to two years in prison. So Elijah's sentence is very much light and compared to these maximums and it reflects his age um, and his inexperience. The addition of corporal punishment was considered a particularly effective deterrent for young boys, sort of short, sharp shock to deter them from reoffending. However, what we can see here, this is a note about his conduct in prison and he's recorded as being disorderly. So we wanted to find out a bit more about what it was like for Elijah in prison. So we consulted the inspectors of prisons reports, which are available through the parliamentary papers archives. Um, and these give us an insight into what Elijah's prison experience might have been like. It's the context um, surrounding Dorchester Jail. Now, Dorchester Jail had been rebuilt in the 1790s along new reformist principles. The new prison supported a regime of solitary confinement, religious observation and hard labour, which was supposed to encourage reflection on one's wrongs, as well as industrious habits to rehabilitate the offender into society. However, the inspector's reports reveal that conditions within the prison were far from ideal. The prison was overcrowded, meaning solitary confinement couldn't be maintained. <clears throat> Excuse me. And allowing such communication between prisoners, the inspector reported, was considered an evil most sensibly felt. Young and impressionable prisoners like Elijah were exposed to all sorts of felons and many feared older and more experienced offenders were schooling them in a life of crime. <clears throat> Excuse me. The living conditions were intentionally tough. The prisoner's diet was meagre, consisting primarily of bread and gruel. Hard labour entailed trudging on the treadmill, which was in operation for about 10 hours a day. And visitors and correspondence with the outside world were only permitted once every six months. These privations were considered useful, tending to increase the line of demarcation which ought to exist between the usages of a prison and the customs and comforts of the world outside. Whippings in the prison could consist of up to 24 lashes. Now, we don't know whether Elijah received that maximum, but we do know that he was whipped twice during his three month sentence. The only concession to juvenile uh, prisoners was to be taught to read and write, but it was a competent prisoner who offered instruction in the absence of a salaried schoolmaster. Now, apparently Elijah's stint in Dorchester jail had little effect on him because we find him in the prison registers again. In 1837, he's back in the county jail for six weeks at hard labour for stealing rabbits. And in 1838, he's committed again for trial for stealing shoes. It's also noted that his behaviour is persistently disorderly in each of these um, records. He does, however, learn to read and write. Um, in the 1837 entry, they 
give it's imperfect is the listing for his education level but by the time uh, we get to 1838 he can read and write we don't know how far that may have been developed through um, his time in the prison anyway we wanted to find out more about elijah's background to help us start to think about why he might have committed these crimes and we had some brilliant volunteers at dorset history center who raided local records and genealogical websites to construct a picture of elijah's family and what we found indicated that Elijah didn't have perhaps much in the way of financial security or guidance at home. We find Henry Upjohn, his father, in the prison registers as well. Henry was a gardener and formerly had been a soldier and he fell foul of the law in 1821. He was convicted of conspiracy to commit a theft from a shop and sentenced to six months imprisonment. Henry faced a further month at hard labour in the county jail in November 1825 for refusing to assist his wife and family. And in 1826, he was charged with breaking and entering and was transported to Australia for seven years. Now, Elijah was probably about three years old when his father left, um, but he didn't ever return to England, so the family was separated at that point. You might argue then that the sorts of opportunistic thefts that Elijah perpetrated were partly motivated by poverty. An attempt by a young boy without regular or permanent work or an adequate family income to make ends meet. Now the courts were tough on repeat offenders like Elijah. No mercy was afforded for his third offence in 1838. He may have been considered incapable of reform and they needed to remove him from society. So he's transported to Australia for seven years in 1838, and he's aged just 16 at this point. Now, the records of those who've been transported are actually really rich. We have lots of material from British and Australian records, uh, archives that have been digitized and put online. Now, I'm sure some people, I think I noticed in the comments, some people mentioned transported ancestors. So hopefully they'll be familiar with the digital panopticon. Um, this is a sister project um, connected to the Old Bailey Proceedings team, and it brings together records from a host of genealogical sites, national archives and Australian archives. So, and it doesn't just cover people who were tried in London. This is a screenshot, I was too scared to try and do this live on the internet, um, of Elijah Upjohn's record. Um, and this is the uh, Life Archive, so it's a kind of little timeline of the records they have available. And you can use the uh, blue hot links on the corner of each of these records to go through and see transcripts or more detailed information and sometimes facsimiles of the original documents. So following some of the sources that are in the digital panopticon, we know that Elijah was held on the Leviathan convict hulk before setting sail for, to, uh, setting sail for Van Diemen's Land, Tasmania, from Portsmouth in March 1839, which is about eight months after his trial. He sailed on a ship called the Marquis of Hastings. Now the National Archives have digitised and put online the surgeon's log for this four month voyage, which gives us a bit of an insight into what it was like. Um, the ship was plagued by sickness owing to cold and damp conditions and we find Elijah being treated for rheumatism by the ship's surgeon. Um, he fared comparatively well actually because seven other convicts died on board that voyage. Libraries Tasmania have made the conduct records of people who were transported um, available and the conduct records covers the kind of duration of their sentence while they were um, in the penal colonies um, in Australia. Now, this is an image of it. It's one of the worst records I've ever had to try and transcribe, I think. It's written and written over as well. Um, but I think I've pulled out enough here to be able to tell you that we you know Elijah was engaged in both public works as part of his sentence, but also assigned to work with different masters. He was also repeatedly punished for neglect of his duty, disorderly behaviour, insolence and going AWOL. Punishments included 24 lashes on one occasion, hard labour and a period of solitary confinement. Um, I think one of my sort of favourites was that he avoided prosecution. He was in fact discharged um, for having a quantity of confectionery improperly in his possession. So this is still the young man who kind of maybe had sweets in his pockets when he shouldn't. Um, the, digital the digital panopticon records that Elijah was given his ticket of leave in August 18, 
44. But we can just make out a note in the conduct record that it looks like he got a free certificate um, in 1845. So rather than a conditional release, he was actually released. Now, one of my favourite all-time digital resources um, has to be Trove. Um, this is the Australian newspaper archive, which is freely available online. And this allows us to track Elijah down under. And again, he's really made visible by his contact with the courts and local government. So we first encounter him in 1845. Um, he doesn't seem to have got off to a very good start. He's been apprehended in possession of counterfeit coins and stolen property and sentenced at Hobart Sessions to two years imprisonment at hard labour. However, by 1852, um, Elijah has moved to the mainland, to Victoria. A notice in the local newspaper seeking information about his lost horse puts him in Geelong, and then he appears as a witness in defence of his brother William at the police court in 1853. Now this last case provides some really interesting and important details. Firstly we have the presence of his brother. Now I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to discuss this with um, some of the staff at Melbourne Jail Museum and we think William emigrated to Australia. He wasn't um, a convict who was transported. Um, but we also know that his father, Henry, um, ended up in Victoria, in Ballarat, uh, so the same region. So there's a possibility, we've yet to sort of track this down, that they may have actually reconnected there. The proceedings against William concerned an accusation of maliciously damaging some trees. Now the complainant, Mr Higgins, um, had previously bought the plot of land and he bought it from Elijah. So we know that Elijah was a property holder, or at least had been, in 1852, uh, 1853, sorry. And then in 1854, and I don't know if you can see this, possibly if you can see our faces over that, um, but uh, we have a notice of Elijah's marriage to a young woman called Anne Cop, originally from Exeter in Devon, at St Paul's Church, Geelong, um, and this is published in the Melbourne Argus. The Founders and Survivors Project, which is another sort of database bit like the Digital Panopticon that looks at the lives of transported convicts, indicates that Elijah and Anne had five children between 1855 and 1864, sadly losing two in their infancy. But what we perhaps see here maybe is the beginnings of a fresh start for Elijah. And from 1859, we find him in Ballarat, which is about 50 miles northwest of Geelong and 70 miles west of Melbourne. And he's trying to cultivate a business as a nightmare. Um, now, the population of this region, particularly Melbourne, was growing rapidly in the middle of the 19th century. And the problem of waste disposal was a serious one. There were no sewers, so waste was disposed of in cesspits or pans in outhouses, which were emptied by nightmen. Um, so not a very glamorous occupation, but probably a very necessary one. I should point out the photograph here is not an image of Elijah, unfortunately. It's a much later image, um, an early 20th century one of Dunny man Andre Gourlay from Broken Hill in New South Wales. But it kind of evoked Elijah for me anyway. The council meetings reported in the press detail Elijah applying for licenses to work as a nightman. And he shows kind of a significant degree of entrepreneurship, I think. He asked both the Eastern and Western Municipal Councils if they would protect him from competition. Neither of them would support a monopoly, but they did agree that they wouldn't allow unlicensed nightmen to operate on his patch. In March 1859, Elijah reports 20 to 30 properties to the town inspector as nuisances, claiming that they were in desperate need of having their pans and outhouses and cesspits emptied. So his aim was to have the business ordered to him. But the inspector and the council chairman refused. It's recorded in the newspaper that the chairman stated, the fact of the matter is, the man wants exorbitant prices. He charges five or six pounds. But I still think it's quite interesting how Elijah is trying to create his own kind of little empire, a monopoly on the local night soil trade. His enterprises, however, were not trouble-free and he clashed with local authorities repeatedly. 
He was refused a license in 1860, and in 1863, his application for another license is only granted on a trial basis. The Star noted it was remarked that the applicant had been fined in the police court for depositing night soil in various parts of the township, and his new license would be revoked on the first complaint. In 1869, he was fined five pounds plus costs or to serve a month in prison for illegally disposing of two loads of night soil in an old quarry. Again, it was reported that Elijah intimated his intention of taking the imprisonment. So it perhaps indicates that he couldn't afford to pay this quite significant fine. In November 1870, he faced a further fine of 20 pounds or three months in prison, again for depositing offensive matter on private property. And the charge received some editorial comments citing his illegal practices on several occasions endangering the health of the population of various parts of the town. So alongside the problems of his business, Elijah also appeared before magistrates at Ballarat Police Court for being drunk and disorderly in 1864 and for, for destroying toys in a toy shop and abusing the landlady of a local hotel in 1867. By 1880, it appears that Elijah had hit rock bottom. In April, he was found in a chicken house, having strangled some 13 of the fowls there. In his defence, he said that he'd been under the influence of liquor and that he had been driven to the crime by want. He was sentenced to 12 months in Ballarat jail. In July, 1880, the Melbourne Herald reported that Elijah had volunteered for the newly vacated position of hangman at Melbourne Jail and would be transferred, transferred from Ballarat to uh, Melbourne. Now, it wasn't necessarily unusual for this particular office to be filled from someone in the prison population. The previous executioner, Michael Gately, was periodically also an inmate at the jail. In his new capacity as both prisoner and executioner, Elijah was brought to public prominence. In November 1880, he undertook his first execution and was responsible for hanging the infamous outlaw Ned Kelly. Now, this image here is um, from the Australasian Sketcher in 1880. It's at the um, State Library of Victoria, but it's also reproduced in the Melbourne uh, Jail Guidebook. And it's brilliant, and I'm hoping people can see it. It gives you a contemporary depiction of Elijah Upjohn, um, something we don't always get. He's also discussed in the press. So this is from the Kilbore Free State Press. Upjohn, the executioner, is by no means the typical hangman of current literature. And though a hardened criminal himself, old in crime and long resident in colonial jails, his worst expression of countenance is that of sulky doggedness. Um, this was his first ex, uh, execution and his objectionable duties were expeditiously performed without the least sign of faltering or nervousness. So apparently he did um, a good job um, on his first time out, as it were. Um, his history and status made him something of a celebrity. He was interviewed by the Herald in uh, 1882 at Pentridge Stockade, which was then a prison. He apparently described himself as paid executioner and public flagellator, sir, to Her Majesty's government of Victoria. The reporter considered him remarkably well, in fact, majestic, towering as he does above those around him. Elijah resided in the jail, but is nevertheless a free man in, in receipt of a salary of five shillings a day, plus food and board. When asked how he liked his role, uh, Elijah's response was both officious and critical and hinted at the prejudicial power of authority, or at least the repercussions of going against it. I'm a paid officer of the Queen and a necessary one too. And there ain't a man in the country can say I'm any the wrong for faithfully doing what I'm paid for, sir, that and obey orders. I've done it afore I saw Australia and seen many a better man nor you and I shot like a dog for refusing to do what them has called themselves gentlemen ordered them to do. Her Majesty's officers orders me to do what I'm paid for. And when I agree to do a thing and don't, then disobedience and breach of government begins. Things that never pay, not in the government service. <laughs> 
So I think he's kind of hinting at his the legitimacy of his role here and perhaps his obedience, but also there's a kind of a sense of bitterness around the ruthlessness of authority and the abuses of gentlemen um, and their officers. The reporter at the end of the article muses on the horror of his office and up John's attachment to it, reasoning that it provided a haven of refuge from the outer world that after an existence of close upon 80 years, he now seeks to shun. Now, the reporter got Elijah's um, age wrong. He's not nearly 80 at this point. But there are kind of implications, I think, in what he's saying, that Elijah may have become partly institutionalised. Um, despite choosing to represent, to represent himself, or perhaps being represented um, as an obedient servant of the state, Elijah was also known for his continued drunk and abusive behaviour. In September 1882, after he was sentenced to three months for obscenely exposing himself in public, the editor of the Melbourne Argus complained that the hangman need not be a person who outrages society, as has been the case with Bamford, Gately and Upjohn. While he was serving this sentence, Elijah continued in his role as flagellator, whipping several prisoners at Pentridge Stockade. And as the Mount Alexander Mail noted, would on his release have money to draw. And I think it's these details that are kind of important to helping us understand Elijah in this role. His motives aren't necessarily perverse or violent. This was a job and one that paid. It offered security in terms of habitation and he was unlikely to face competition for it. He continued in his office until 1884. In August, it was reported that he had not properly positioned the noose at the execution um, of a convict called Hawthorne. Elijah had gone himself to the local paper to present his case, explaining that the head warder of the jail had fumbled the knot and roundly denied any suggestions that he was drunk or kept poor time. Nonetheless, he was suspended from his role by the chief secretary in October, who said when he wanted a man hanged, he wanted a man he could rely on. The impact and importance of this work for Elijah, I think are evident when he finds himself dispossessed and living as a vagrant. From the end of 1884, it was reported in the Maitland Mercury and the Portland Guardian that he was living on handouts from the Salvation Army and sleeping rough in outhouses. In continual dread of his life and would scarcely move away from the precincts of any point of safety. In February 1885, he was arrested for vagrancy, sleeping rough behind Melbourne Jail, one of the entrances to the jail is depicted here. He said that the larrikins, who are kind of young street rowdies, to use Stephen Slate's term, frequently molested him and that some have threatened him with bodily harm. He'd been abused in the street for several years owing to his position and he'd been previously um, attacked, he'd been attacked uh, physically the previous year in 1884. He was sentenced to a month in prison for this vagrancy at the police court and he told the magistrate that his life was a misery. He claimed the prison governor had promised him another job when he was let go in 1884 and all he wanted was something honest to do. The magistrate said he couldn't continue to let him be a nuisance in the town but he'd write to the governor and inquire about this uh, job prospect that had been mentioned. Um, we don't hear too much else about Elijah but in July it's reported that he'd been sent to Sydney and unfortunately in October, he's found dead in his tent at Bork, which is at the top of the map there on the left, which is a river port about 600 miles north from Melbourne. The press reported rumours that he was escaping those he'd flogged in Victoria and may have been poisoned, but it's perhaps also conceivable that the court had tried to find him some other opportunity whilst successfully removing this nuisance from Melbourne. So Elijah's is perhaps an extraordinary case not all lives are detailed in this extent, uh, to this extent, but hopefully I've demonstrated how we can fit little pieces of evidence together to recover experiences of people through their contact with criminal justice and local government. One thing that struck me when I was looking through some of the Australian genealogical websites, um, looking at uh, records regarding Elijah, was on one that his occupations were listed variously as convict, executioner and prisoner. 
but he was more than that. He was a husband and a father. He was an entrepreneur when he was trying to set up as a nightman. He also had agency in resisting authority, in the way he conducted his business, in playing the system of local government where he could, and even in creating his own image as a servant of the crown. And these stories have value beyond recovering the lives of those who might otherwise be overlooked. We've used this case at Shire Hall to encourage visitors to reflect on the causes of youth offending and the impact of the criminal justice system on young people in the past, but also the present. And it's still such a debated subject. Even this week, it was reported that the Children's Commissioner has called for a complete overhaul of the youth custody system, drawing attention to the extent of violence and physical restraint used in these institutions and the lack of opportunities for education and support that have only been exacerbated under lockdown conditions. So I suppose my point is really that we can use past lives to help us think differently about our own. So we need to keep researching them. Um, this is a list of resources that um, I've used uh, in this talk today or mentioned as well. I've also added the TUC History Online, which isn't specifically about criminal justice histories, um, but there's loads of amazing primary material there if you haven't already looked. Um, and also the Our Criminal Ancestors Project. Um, their website has some absolutely fantastic research guides that support people looking for criminal ancestors, but also help you interpret some of those records by providing some excellent historic context. Um, if I've got time, there's one um, other thing that I should probably point out. The resources uh, listed on the right are ones that you need a paid subscription to access, which does sort of, you know, challenge perhaps some of that democratic idea that uh, Tim Hitchcock and Bob Shoemaker kind of were applauding um, with the launch of the Old Bailey Proceedings, which is free to access. But we also have to remember that archives get some revenue from partnering with sites like Ancestry and they are perpetually underfunded. And we can often get access to these uh, websites through our own public libraries as well. What we have seen during the pandemic is a number of sites making more online material available for free. The National Archives have done this, um, JSTOR has done this. Um, and I was reading an article last week actually that JISC, the Education and Technology Not-for-Profit Organization, are looking at brokering bulk purchase um, of collections for digitization, working with libraries and publishers and academics, and looking at models for sustainable access. So limiting paid subscriptions for a particular period to cover costs and then making them freely available after the expiration of that period. So there may be the possibility for longer lasting change that has been triggered by this extraordinary context. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rose. Thank you very much indeed. That was brilliant. If you could turn off your shared screen, that'd be great. Uh, we have one question from Gemma. Uh, Gemma, who's going to be a first year student of yours next year, Ooh. you'll be pleased to know. And Hi Gemma. Asking, she's asking uh, what would be the best way to uh, to start this sort of research. And she's looked at your list and I said, well, does this list answer your question? And she said, no, she wants to know where the best place to start would be. Well, actually, I think, I think, well, st potentially start with the Old Bailey Proceedings, partly because they give a wonderful kind of really accessible background information to the operation of the court but and lots of sort of suggested readings lots of explanation about what you can do and the cases themselves are as i said freely available um, and really really rich in detail just the most extraordinary um, amounts of stuff but also to have a look at the uh, guides on our criminal ancestors and then if you've got the opportunity dive into some of the regional archives the dorset uh, court sessions records are really full and it's more than just the prison registers that are available on Ancestry. They've got court order books, they've got some convict photograph albums, um, so you can find out all sorts of things and maybe kind of, I don't know, try and set up a project to trace these things. I don't want it all to go metropolitan focused. I think we should be looking no, at, no, no. That, at that, the regions as well. Issue, yeah. That is a big issue. It's, it's very uh, urban centric really uh, and there's a lot of rural stuff that uh, we really need to, to get into in a way. Um, I hope that answers your question, Jeff. If it doesn't, please come back to us. Um, I, I mean, would you say uh, would you say that uh, um, the, 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 you just go onto Google and type in Old Bailey Records, and that's going to come up somewhere? 
Um, if you put in on your list there. Yeah, if you put in Old Bailey online into Google, it will just, it should be the first thing that takes you there. And it's a really beautifully easy site to navigate. And like I said, just full of the most amazing kind of contextual and yeah, background information as well as the okay. cases themselves. Uh, another question from Malcolm saying, please could you expand a little on Trove? I have to say, I didn't know Trove existed, so there we go. Well, I kind of stumbled across Trove actually when I was looking for, um, when I was looking at developing Elijah's case, one of the, um, volunteers had found a family history blog that said we think Elijah was the executioner for Ned Kelly and I went are you sure and they went yeah and I said right we need primary evidence for this you know I'm not gonna I want to check all the references um, and I found Trove and it's just the most amazing archive it's um in some respects I think it's perhaps easier to use than the British newspaper archive if people have had um, experience of using that and it has facsimile editions of all sorts of certainly I've only looked at the 19th century ones 19th century newspapers um, that are keyword searchable and they provide transcripts now the transcripts aren't always great because it's trying to do text recognition and it sort of does creative spelling but you can find things really easily and there's all sorts of regions covered I mean Victoria and New South Wales were particularly well covered um, but I think the most popular areas they would be um, but they also give links to magazine articles. It goes right through into the 20th century. There's magazine articles. There's all sorts of other things as well. And it's part of the National Libraries Australia kind of, yeah, um, provision. And it's just, I mean, it's a wonderful resource. We have so many paywalls on our newspaper archives over here, which is a real shame. I agree with you. Uh, another question's come in from Chris Jones. Uh, I'm not sure if this is a particularly easy one to it. Also, was it common for people to attempt to join their transported relatives? Certainly, with regard to the Tolpala Martyrs, for example, the government made an offer to send uh, the wives out, didn't they? And uh, yeah. uh, George Lovelace found himself in a dreadful situation where he was uh, waiting for a ship to come in because he didn't know whether Betsy, his wife and children were on that ship. Yeah. Uh, but that was a very rare occurrence, wasn't it? I mean, I, I rather assume in some cases people did go off to join transport. Yeah, relatives. well, I think it's expensive business. I think there's a couple of points there. I mean, I can't categorically say how often it happened. I and mean, transportation, really off the back of working the Shire Hall and working on the Tolpot and Martyrs case and working on Elijah Upjohn's, transportation is now kind of a new particular interest of mine that's kind of, yeah, burgeoning. And I'm hoping to bore everybody to tears with it next year at the festival as well. Um, but um, the point about Tolpot and Martyrs is they were using George Lovelace's family as leverage as well. They were trying to get him to accede to different conditions by saying we'll bring your family to yeah. you and I think that was really sort of that was perhaps very unusual. The thing about William and it's something we discussed, uh, William Upjohn, something we discussed with colleagues at Melbourne Jail is the timing of when he goes out in the 1850s that's when actually kind of convict transportation is dwindling but um, the gold rush is starting so you will probably have more people going out to kind of think about making their fortune and William shares in that you know not particularly sort of yeah affluent background that Elijah had so actually going out there at that point um may have been yeah a useful point. and having a point of contact there was a lot of correspondence between but how far people could afford to do that is another matter there were assisted migration programs in the 1830s some local authorities would fund people to migrate because if they were struggling to find work here then it would take the burden off the rates they would kind of do a one-off we'll send you out um and then off you go so there were programs like that as well particularly with paupers uh, certain certain parishes actually sent paupers out because yeah. it was a very good way of uh of uh, getting those people off the poor law and therefore mm -hmm. they were no longer a, a, a stone around the poor law uh, commissioners next really yeah absolutely uh, and, uh, amanda's asking if you'd be willing to do a session on women convicts in dorset for our branch in dorchester or at one of the regional and national conference fringe meetings and workshops. Amanda is a, a committed trade unionist. I think that I think sounds like an excellent project, Amanda. Yeah, absolutely. So I think I will, I'll let Amanda contact you at UWE. She'll find Yeah, you please, please. I, Amanda, my, um, my Twitter is Osmond Wallace, um, or you can find me, just look up Rose Wallace Yui and you've got my email and my staff profile. So yeah, that sounds like a great idea. <laughs> even more stuff to do. 
Uh, one of the things I was interested in you were talking about was the idea that in Elijah's prison record, they actually physically described him. The only other place I can think I know that happens was in the transportation records, particularly in Tasmania, where they were very good at measuring people, uh, writing down uh, certain characteristics that they had, their height, their weight, yeah. their scars, moles, whatever. And those records are extremely useful, aren't they? I think so. I think it's, I mean, I've got colleagues actually who've used prison registers um, to track standards of living because you can actually look at people's physicality to understand, yeah, what the sort of conditions of living are if you do a longitudinal data study. But you're right, Les, the conduct record, we've got his physical description as well. One thing I should have mentioned actually is this little four foot ten boy in 1834 becomes a six foot plus man by the time he's transported and he's quite often repeatedly described as being imposing and I think it's quite important to acknowledge the physicality of these people it again it adds to that sense of them being real people who lived in the past what was quite interesting actually in the Dorset jail registers I think it's the Dorset ones um, is they don't list the physical descriptions of female convicts for a while um, which I don't know if that's something to do with propriety um, but yeah they don't it's really interesting. I've, I've not. I, we suddenly noticed when we were looking for physical descriptions um, of some of our female case studies that in the museum that actually, yeah, it was. Um, uh, yeah, they don't include them, which is really strange. Well, that's very interesting, isn't it? I mean, the other, well, the other thing I uh, was going to talk about was the Panopticon, mm. because uh, that, that was a model prison, wasn't it? And they, you've now got this digital Panopticon. And yeah. The, the, the only Panopticon I've ever been in is the one in Tasmania. Well, it's very heavily reliant on um, uh, individual cells for individual prisoners. They never saw the person in the yeah. next cell. It really was solitary confinement, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, the Panopticon yeah. is designed by Jeremy Bentham. I think design is yeah. published in 1790. His body, actually, he left his body um, for scientific investigation and it was stuffed, taxidermied um, and put... Um, on display at University College London. I was there for a very short period and we could walk past Jeremy Bentham's body in a box. But anyway, um, the Panopticon um, prisons, they've been really influential. Although he never built the Panopticon that he'd planned, it's been massively influential on prison design since that point. And you will have not just the separate separation of the of prisoners, but um, the sort of the uh, arrangement, the circular arrangement allows for surveillance, total surveillance was part of it. What's perhaps concerning, um, I think, from Bentham's work, actually, was the suggestion that it could be used for workhouses as well. Yeah. And elements of the design are used in workhouses, the surveillance and the separation side of it. And I just think that that's one of those dangerous crossovers between punishing the criminal um, and then housing the poor, but by proxy punishing the poor as well, by putting them into those sorts of institutions. Um, so the Panopticon design has been used to kind of, yeah, really used in um, some of the big, um, oh, what they call supermax prisons in the States, yeah. actually. There are some extraordinary yeah. photographs of these appalling cells and the conditions. I mean, they are there just to remove these people and punish them. It's purely retributive in that context, I think. There's very little in the way, I think, of hope for reform in those contexts. But... That's my soapbox, I'll get off it. <laughs> no, 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 Michael's just pointed out there's one at Lincoln, which I, I, I think I've been around Lincoln, but I don't remember going in the Panopticon there. So uh, he says at Lincoln Castle Prison, there's a Panopticon. I don't remember ever seeing it. So there we go. Well, Rose, we've had uh, some absolutely fantastic comments come in. Uh, thank you very much to everyone who's attended, particularly thanks to you. I just thought that was a, a brilliant, brilliant chat. It's an absolute um, pleasure to be here, Les. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, and uh, I hope next year we'll, we'll be able to meet again in tents and, uh, yes. and actually talk about migration. You and I have talked about uh, transportation, yeah. so I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and uh, I know that Tanya's putting up some stuff about links tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow morning we've got uh, John Callow talking about uh, Michelet, the great French historian who wrote the great 18th, uh, 18th volume uh, History of France. Dave Steele's been with us this afternoon. He's... Uh, said how much he enjoyed all the links to Australia. Fascinating talk, Rose. I love all the links with Australia. Dave Steele's talking tomorrow afternoon about the great Chartist gathering in 1848. So we look forward to seeing you there, Dave. And uh, there's another question come in just before we go, as far as I can see. Uh, the, uh, Michael Butler said the prisoners were kept isolated in pan panopticons, apart from those who were condemned and were beyond hope. There we are, beyond hope. 
It's uh, been absolutely fascinating, Rose. Thank you very much. Absolutely okay. fascinating. Uh, I, I, all the comments I've seen have been brilliant. It's been a great pleasure to work with you again. I uh, look forward to being in touch with you in the very near future. Okay. And now, thank you so thank much you, for taking part and uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Yeah, you too, Les. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Bye.